Lord, we just come to you, Father, and we just thank you, Lord, for just another Wednesday and to come together and study your word. We, we thank you, Father, for, for just a, a good group here tonight, Father, that just want to be refreshed by your word. We want to see Jesus exalted and lifted up tonight, Father. We're just so grateful, and, and we love our church family and how we're encouraged every time we get together and just the conversations that we have. And we just pray that you would speak to our hearts tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So by the way, this, these Bible studies, they're meant for interjections. If you've got some things that you want to add, it's not just a, a one-way one street for me. Uh, I can, I'll certainly give you my study of it but if you got some thoughts and things that you want to share feel free to join in but we are in hebrews and we are uh, in chapter two last week was the introduction chapter one and this is going to be a good study it's going to be a good deep study that's uh, going to be an encouragement do you remember who hebrews was written to save jews the hebrews right not Shebrews, Hebrews, right? That's right. The saved ones. The saved ones, that's right. That's right. They were facing persecution, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Why was it written? Because they felt like giving up. They felt like going back. It's, it's not worth following Christ. This isn't worth it. Let's go back to the old ways. They came from Judaism. Let's go back to Judaism. Uh, it was written... It would, have, it would have had to have been written before 70 A.D. because that's when the Romans came and burned Jerusalem. And as we get into the disciplines of Hebrews and the warnings of Hebrews, a lot of, well, a lot of them, there's five warnings. Several, I don't want to say, a couple of the warnings refer to God's discipline and the discipline was the Romans coming in So it was uh, and, and burning Jerusalem. So uh, it would be around 68 to 69 uh, A.D. is when it was written. We don't know who wrote it, so we're just going to say God wrote it. God wrote it. The purpose, the author's writing in order to urge his readers to move on in faith and maturity. Don't go back to the old ways, despite the persecution, despite how you feel. Don't go back so that they would avoid the discipline of God and receive a full reward for their faith. The theme, if somebody asks you, what is Hebrews all about? Hebrews is all about the superiority of Christ. It's like, it's like a college thesis paper. <laughs> it's an argument why Jesus is so great, why Jesus is better than everything, everybody. Why would you want to go back? Why would you want to go back and get under the law and all those rules and rituals when Jesus is so much greater? That's the theme. So it centers around several examples of Christ being superior as well as five warnings to not return back to the old way. Last week we saw uh, the first... Uh, first few verses Christ is a superior revelation what that means is well it opens up in times past in the Old Testament God spoke through various ways he spoke through prophets he spoke through uh, through visions and dreams and so forth well now in this new covenant that we're in he speaks through Jesus he's a superior revelation uh, we saw the seven exaltations of Christ the first uh, four verses uh, list seven dynamic statements about Christ. And then we also saw he's superior over the angels. Hello. You get a front row seat. Of course. And you don't even have to pay extra for it. So chapter two continues with Christ's superiority over the angels. But first, he takes a break. And he interjects the first of five warnings to the Hebrews. So warning number one is the danger of drifting. And that's chapter 2, verse 1 through verse 4. And the danger of drifting. So he says, therefore. You know in Bible study, when you see the word therefore, you need to know what it's there for, right? <laughs> that's what It means it's. It's a, it's a conjunction. It's bringing what was previously wrote about. It's, it's, it, the therefore is putting the two together. So it's tying chapter 1 and chapter 2 together. So in lieu of everything we read in chapter 1, 
in lieu of all how great Christ is. Therefore, in lieu of that, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Lest we drift away. Notice he says we. That's why this is, that's why we know one, one of the ways that we know that it's written to Christians because the author is a Christian and he's putting himself, the, he's saying we, not just you. We drift away. For if the word spoken through the angels proved steadfast, I'm using a New King James Version, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. So this is one of those passages in Hebrews that's often misinterpreted. There's some phrasing in here that could uh, be misconstrued. So I figure it'd be good to take these first four verses and let's break it down phrase by phrase so we can understand the intent of what the writer's saying. Exegesis. You ever heard the word exegesis? It basically just means to break things down, <laughs> to open it up, go word by word. It's just a theological term. So we will exegete. So when you hear somebody say, let's exegete this verse, it means we're just going boom, 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 word by word by word, studying what does it say in the Greek. So anyways, so let's start in verse 1. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard. We must, we must. That carries the idea of it is necessary. It is of necessity. We must. It stresses the urgency of the warning. In that original context, he, he, the writers will sense his urgency. We must. Remember, Hebrews is like a thesis paper, as I, as I mentioned, where the author is arguing the case on why Jesus is greater, why you don't need to go back to the old way. So you've got, you need, I'm stressing this. He says, therefore, we must give earnest heed to the things we have heard. Earnest heed means pay attention. <laughs> pay attention to the things we have heard. What are the things we have heard? Well, the things that we have talked about in the first chapter. Specifically, the, the beginning, the seven dramatic statements about Christ, the, superior of Christ, the superiority of Christ over the angels. So give, pay attention, pay attention uh, to, to what you just heard, to what you just read. Then he says, lest we drift away, lest we drift away. This is the only time that this phrase is used in the New Testament, lest we drift away. It could also imply lest we slip away. Some translations say lest we slip away. It's the idea of uh, a shoe slipping off your foot, sandals slipping off your foot, thoughts slipping away from your mind. It could also be used uh, drift away as a ship that's, drifted off course a ship that drifted away because the anchor didn't hold so he's implying that the, the, it, it, it looks like that the Hebrews they have grown complacent they're starting to drift they're starting to drift away they've become careless they've become negligent and so they're in danger of drifting away like a boat drifting at sea. The problem is not that they've rejected the spiritual things. It's that they've neglected the spiritual things. He's speaking to Christians. They've neglected these, these things. They've neglected the word. They've neglected the necessary things that'll keep them strong in their faith. That'll keep them from drifting. So he says, we must give earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. You're in danger of drifting away because you're, because you're ne negligent of the things that, that keep you anchored, the things that keep you strong. 
through, and, and we'll see as we get into it further. I mean, he, he mentions uh, meeting together, fellowshipping together. He mentions the word. The word is mentioned. Uh, so they're, they're negligent of the word. They're, they're moving away from the word. They're moving away from prayer together and worship together and fellowship together. And all these things cause you to, to drift away, to drift away. One commentator that I was studying wrote, as the captain sleeps, the ship drifts into peril. And that's what's happening. They're drifting away. Not because they've rejected the things of Christ, but because they're negligent of the things of Christ. And isn't that the, the reason why so many drift away from Christ? It's not that they're rejecting Christ, but they're negligent of the things of Christ. They're, they're, they're not paying attention to the things that keep them strong in their faith. There's disciplines that are required to, to be strong in faith. Disciplines like reading the word of God. That's a discipline. Prayer. Coming together like this. Meeting together. Praying together. Uh, worshiping together. Fellowship. These are certain disciplines that you do to keep from drifting away, right? <laughs> That's why so many people drift away. It's not because they've turned their back to Christ. It's just because they've just well, I don't, I don't have time to read my Bible today. I'm not going to come to church today. I'm not going to worship. I'm not going to pray today. In the when things are good, that's usually when when, when times are really good. Uh, that's usually that's an easy time to start drifting, isn't it? <laughs> when times are good, when all the needs are met, when everything's good. Oh, I think I'll just go on out here. I'll go to the I'll go to the beach. I'll do this. I'll do that in those bad times that we need that reserve to hold to the reserve of, of faith lest we drift away any thoughts on that can you can you see that have you ever seen that in your life I think COVID and the closing down of churches that was in my mind that was in my closing mind down of churches, mm -hmm. we weren't able to fellowship together we weren't able to share um, our needs our, our encouragement with each other, we weren't able to compare notes in any mm -hmm. way. I mean, we did have emails and Facebooks mm -hmm. and things like that, but um, there's something lost in that mm -hmm. impersonal um, interchange. Mm -hmm. And now I understand churches are having a hard time getting people to go back because mm -hmm. they've gotten out of the habit. Yep. And we came back after two months. Imagine these churches that are just now starting to open up. Mm -hmm. And still, some are still closed. <laughs> I, mean, I don't care. I don't care where you where you're at, what state you're in. If you're not back in church, if, if churches aren't opened up at this point, you're not a church. <laughs> you're not a church. There's only so much of online. We have online to help people that are unable because they're sick or whatever. Online is not another way to have church. It's not an alternative to church. There's just something about coming together, right? It's scriptural also. for sake. And, and that's part of Hebrews. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. People don't know how to handle the trials of life. People don't know when, when tragedy comes. You know, they, they don't know how to handle things. It's, it's because they've been negligent. <laughs> they've been negligent. It's because they've gotten away. When you stay close to the Lord, when you stay in God's word, you do you have something that you can draw upon when those tough times come, right? So they were in danger of drifting away. Remember, uh, remember they felt like giving up. See, that's what happens. A lot, a lot of times Christians, they feel like giving up when tragedies come, when they face hurts and disappointments. I'm ready to quit. I'm ready to throw in the towel. Well, why? Well, it's, be it, it, it's because you've become negligent. <laughs> A person, a person that's facing trials and tribulations, that's strong in the Lord and they're in God's word and their faith is built up. Yeah, you get a little discouraged, but you know what? You keep on keeping on. You find, you find that, that measure of faith to keep on going because you're, you're not negligent to the things of Christ. So look at verse 2. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast. Okay, so this is another kind of confusing phrase. 
the word steadfast means legally binding here. If the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, uh, we mentioned last week, this is referring to the angels giving the law of Moses. That's one of the reasons why the Jews held the angels in such high regards and why the writer is saying Jesus is greater than the angels because the Jews, I mean, it was, they had such admiration for the angels because it was the angels who gave them the law, the most holy contract to, to the Jew. So the point is here, if the Mosaic law given by angels was legally binding, was steadfast, it was binding in terms of its stipulations and its punishments for those who transgress the law, how much more this new revelation given by Christ. I mean, it's another way of, of, say, of saying Christ is superior to the angels. The angels gave you the law, and what happened when you, when you disobeyed the law? God punished you. Well, what about this new law? What about this new revelation that Jesus gave you? <laughs> if, if you were punished for disobeying the law, how much greater will it be for, for those under grace who has received uh, this word given by Christ? It's legally binding. He says in verse 3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Neglecting so great of salvation. See, this is uh, another one of those phrases where people have misconstrued it, uh, where they've tried to say that this is about non-believers refusing to receive salvation. Uh, notice it's neglecting salvation. It's not rejecting salvation. He's talking about those who are neglecting the salvation you already have. You're, ne you're negligent to the things you already have in Christ. So he's not encouraging sinners to become Christians. Rather, he's encouraging Christians to pay attention to what they already have. So he says, how shall we escape if we neglect, if we don't pay attention to, the, to, to this great salvation? How shall we escape? The escape, what is escape referring to? Well, some people say it's referring to hell. No, it's not referring to hell. It's referring to eternal punishment. No, it's not referring to eternal punishment. Remember, he's talking to believers. He's talking to those who, on the, who are on the verge of neglecting this great, neglecting what they have. So the escape here is referring to the discipline of God, not being cast into everlasting punishment, not being thrown into hell. It's, it's a reference to the chastisement or the discipline of God. In other words, if those who neglect the law were disciplined, how much more those who neglect what you have in salvation? How much more those who neglect, just like uh, those who disobeyed the law experienced discipline, so those who neglect so great a salvation will also receive discipline from the Lord, chastisement from the, from the Lord, even loss of rewards in the future kingdom. And we'll get into, we'll get into that as well through, um, we'll get into the discipline of God because Hebrews talks about the discipline of God. I think some people are just in this pipe dream that now that we're under grace, there is no discipline for the child of God. There is no, it's all under grace, all under grace. Everything is covered, 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 covered. Do it, do what you want to do. No, what he's saying is to whom much is given, much is required. <laughs> Under grace, you've got this great salvation. It, it, you'll receive greater discipline because you've been given such a great, such a great salvation. Um, the reason why this discipline also refers to loss of rewards in the kingdom of God is because if you go back to the uh, to the first chapter, all of the all of those Old Testament quotations are referring to the future kingdom age when Christ is the head of all things, when, when Christ establishes his kingdom. So if you neglect this great salvation, if you, put, if you put the first chapter in with this, he's talking about discipline in life, and he's also talking about loss of rewards in the future kingdom because they receive such a great salvation, such a greater revelation 
of Jesus. I hope that makes sense. In other words, <laughs> in other words, look at what you have in Christ. Look at what you have in Christ. Look at how great salvation is. How great a salvation is. How shall we escape punishment? Why, how do you think you're going to escape discipline when you've got so much more than what those under the law have? It's the case for, it's the case for discipline for the believer. It's the case for discipline for the believer. Any thoughts on that? Any questions on that? Then the writer, he, he uh, further emphasizes the point in verse 4. He says, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. So not only have we received the word of Christ, the word from Christ, not only did Christ confirm the word, but the word has also been confirmed through miracles, signs, and wonders. The Holy Spirit has confirmed this word. And of course, Acts, we see the apostles confirming the word through, through uh, salvation, through confirming salvation with miracles, signs, and wonders in the power of the Holy Spirit. So in summary, this first warning, beware of drifting away. Beware of being tempted to go back to the old system. Don't neglect the salvation you have. <coughs> Makes me think of, an example would be the Israelites. Remember when the Israelites complained in, in the wilderness after God delivered, they complained, complained, and complained. Well, God disciplined them. <laughs> remember, remember what they received. It's the same consequence. Even more because we've got something greater. He's saying you're in danger of forfeiting reward in the kingdom. Why do you want to go back? Why do you want to forfeit what you have? Why do you want to forfeit God's blessing by turning back? You've got more to lose by going back and drifting away because of persecution than you do just by standing strong. You might face persecution here, but I promise you, you've got more to lose by going back to the old system. You might have to face persecution. You will face trials. Some might even be put to death, but you still have more to lose by turning back because ultimately that's what this life is all about. It's, a, it's, a, it's about a setup for the future life, right? It's about obtaining eternal reward in heaven, in the kingdom, in the eternal kingdom of God. And so that's the warning, the first warning. Any thoughts on that? Okay, so now the after he the writer interjects the warning, he gets back to the um, he gets back to the topic of the angels, Christ's superiority over the angels, and he and here's the breakdown. Here's the breakdown for the rest of the chapter. Maybe you can write it down because I'm going to go through this pretty pretty quick. Verses five through nine, Christ regains man's lost dominion. The angels can't. The angels can't. Five through nine, Christ regains man's lost dominion. The angels can't. Verses 10 through 13, Christ was able to bring sons to glory. Angels can't do that either. Remember, this is all, Jesus is so much greater than the angels. Verses 14 through 16, Christ disarmed Satan and delivered us from death. The angels can't do that. He disarmed Satan and delivered us from death. The angels can't do that. <laughs> Verse 17 and 18, Christ is a sympathetic high priest to his people. The angels aren't. So let me just read through, through the rest of this and you'll, and you'll see what I'm talking about here. Verses 5 through 9, Christ regains man's lost dominion. Angel, angels can't. Verse 5 says, for he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. In other words, he's not putting angels in charge of the world. Jesus is. Jesus is. Verse six, but one testified in a certain place saying, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him? Does anybody know where he's quoting from? It's in Psalms. It is Psalms eight. That's right. 
Yep. You can read Psalms 8 and it is, he is, he is quoting. He says, uh, you have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the work of your hands. He's referring to man. Ultimately, Jesus, man. <laughs> You have put all things in subjection under his feet. This is all Psalms 8. For in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put, that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Christ regains man's lost dominion, angels can't. What is, what is this? What's a summary of all that? Well, we know that God created man and woman to have dominion over the earth, right? You know that kingdom principle. He created man to take dominion, to be, to, everything on earth was to be sub subject to man and woman. But we know that man and woman sinned. <laughs> They were created inferior to angels, but they had greater authority and power. Who is, who, he's created a little lower than angels. It just means they were, they were inferior in beings. Man was an inferior being than a spirit angel that never, you know, that could be everywhere. At the same, ever, but, but he gave man dominion. He was given a privilege higher than the angels, but man sinned and lost dominion. But we see Jesus, verse 9. Man was given dominion, man lost the dominion because of sin, but verse 9 says, but we see Jesus. Through the cross of Jesus, through the resurrection of Jesus, it says he was crowned with glory and honor, and he restored the dominion that man lost. That's basically a summary. Jesus restored the dominion that man lost. Angels didn't. Angels didn't. Would you say that dominion is a greater word than salvation? Or is it included? I mean, you know, you know, you can say God so loved the world and gave his own to God. Uh -huh. Whoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's one point. Mm -hmm. Dominion gives you 10,000 reasons. You should accept salvation. Not just one, you know. Mm -hmm. Not say, well, we're all going to heaven, you know. That's just part of it. Mm -hmm. the dominion is the rest of it. Yeah, I would say dominion, dominion can be along the lines of authority, dominion, authority. And so that certainly comes with, that's one of the benefits of salvation. Jesus, man lost, man was created to be in authority. Man was created to rule the earth. He lost that dominion. He lost that authority. Jesus got it back. When we receive Jesus, when we receive salvation, that authority is restored to us. So it could, it's definitely included for sure. For sure. And the point here is that no angel could do this. Christ is superior. He says in verse 10, um, well, 10 through 13, Christ was able to bring sons to glory. Okay, it says in verse 10, for it was fitting for him for whom all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons, that could be sons, daughters, humans, okay, to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Christ is the captain of salvation. Captain here literally means the pioneer is what it could mean, the pioneer of salvation. A pioneer is one who opens the way for others to follow. And that was Christ. like a pioneer in the old wild west. The pioneers, they paved the, the trail, the Oregon Trail, and Lewis and Clark and all those, they led the way. They led the way. So Jesus is the pioneer of our salvation. Jesus is the one who through, through what he did, he paved the way 
through him becoming man, through him going to the cross, dying, resurrection, restored to glory. He paved the way for us to be restored to, to glory. So that second part, Christ was able to bring sons to glory. Angels can't. Angels can't. So now we, because of Christ, we share the glory. We share that same glory. There's another phrase in here that um, people can get caught up with. It says, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Some people have tried to make this out to be that Jesus was imperfect. That there was a time when Jesus was imperfect. Oh, see, Jesus, he wasn't perfect. But that's not what this means. It doesn't mean that Jesus was imperfect when he was here on earth and he needed to become perfect. No, the word perfect here means complete, effective, adequate. So what this means is by what Jesus did, by him becoming man, dying, rising from the grave, ascending into heaven, by him doing that, that is, that is what made him become the perfect sacrifice, the perfect pioneer. It's what Jesus did. He, he wasn't imperfect and became. No, what he did is what made him out to be the perfect, adequate, complete, once for all sacrifice. So that's what that means. Verse 11 is part of that second phrase, second category of verses for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all one who do you think the one who sanctifies is jesus who are the ones being sanctified us jewish believers us We're... remember jesus is the one with the glory he paved the way for us to receive that glory so the one who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are one because of what Jesus did. He is not ashamed for, for which reason? He is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. This is another awesome phrase. He's quoting here Psalms 22, verse 22, in which Christ refers to, to his church, to the church as his brethren. I mean, that's a pretty phenomenal statement that um, both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are one, that Jesus calls us brethren. <laughs> Verse 13, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I. And the children whom God has given me, here the writer's quoting from Isaiah 8, 17, to 8, 17 through 18. So in verse 11, this pioneer of salvation, this great Jesus who has restored us to glory, verse 11, he calls us his brethren. Verse 13, he calls us his children. <laughs> So we are his brethren and his children. Brethren, he calls us brethren because he became like us. He calls us his children because he's God. I mean, this all points to the deity of Christ. Jesus became like us, but Jesus is also God. You see that? We're his children and we're, we're his children as he is our God. We're his brethren as he is our, our savior. And that's what qualifies him to bring us to glory. Verses 14 through 16. So, so Christ regained man's lost dominion, something angels can't do. Christ brought us to glory, something angels can't do. It's because he's the pioneer of salvation. Verses 14 through 16, Christ disarmed Satan and delivered us from death. No angels done that. I mean, it's, I mean, this guy's just laying, he's just going, he's getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into why Jesus is so much great. What angel has ever defeated death, has ever disarmed Satan? Look at verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. 
Children have partaken of flesh and blood. You children, you know you have partaken flesh and blood. When you were born, you partook flesh and blood. You understand that. He himself likewise shared in the same. Jesus, he, Jesus took on the same flesh and blood as us. That through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Let's say to people. <laughs> of course, he's writing to the literal seed of Abraham. Jesus didn't come to save angels. Jesus came to save us, to save these persecuted Hebrews. So the way, the only way he could save us who are flesh and blood is he had to become flesh and blood. He had to take on the same flesh and blood. He had to become a man. He had to die a man in order to save us, in order to defeat death, in order to overcome the one who has the power of death. And that's Satan. So he disarmed Satan and he delivered us from death. I also found it interesting when it said that, um, that through death he might destroy him. Of course, that doesn't mean he literally annihilated Satan through the cross because we know Satan is still active. Satan was not annihilated. To destroy here means to render inoperative. To disarm. That's why that's, it says to disarm Satan. That's what destroyed. It doesn't mean to annihilate, but he disarmed Satan. He rendered him inoperative to make of none effect. He's disarmed. He's disarmed. That means that those of us who trust in Jesus as Savior, we've been delivered from Satan's authority. We've been delivered from final death. But... Satan is disarmed from power over our life. I've heard people say before, the only power that Satan has over us is the power that we give to him because he's been rendered inoperative, disarmed. And that's through Jesus, through the cross, through the resurrection of Christ. We have victory over death. We have victory and authority over Satan, over the one who holds the power of death. Isn't that awesome? How many of us are walking in that authority over the enemy, over Satan? Doesn't look like too many Christians walking in that authority over Satan, are they? You don't see that. You don't see. See, I see more people living in defeat. I see more people living as if Satan is in authority over them. But, but truthfully, through Jesus, <coughs> Satan has been disarmed. He's been disarmed. Amen. Did you say something about demons? Yeah. You know, that all of these prophecies that are being used as an example of uh, his dominion over Satan and so forth, um, it, it's the argument you can use against the cults who equate Jesus as an angel or mm -hmm. as a prophet or as a teacher or a high priest or any of those other, but especially the ones that say he's equal, he's a brother mm -hmm. to Lucifer. Like last week that we was yeah, to the Mormons and uh, the Jehovah Witnesses. These Witness are and... all arguments to be used against mm -hmm. that logic or that theology. Yeah, that 100%. 100 percent i mean i've had times when i felt like this is something i'm doing that's not i didn't want to do but I, something's pushing me yeah and that's as long as you pray to the, the demon you know mm -hmm. get the him in the name of jesus that's right yeah that happens that is right absolutely if you don't do that i don't get any relief mm. Mm -hmm. I feel mm -hmm. The power yep. 
of death that is the devil. That's right. You may destroy it. So these are big, these are just big, big phrases that it, it takes reading through it and reading through it. I mean, what we're talking about tonight, I mean, I know it could be, well, this way up here, but just, you know, that's why you take your notes and that's why you just go back and read and just let it, let it sink in. Let it, it's, it's, this is like, it's got to be a revelation. It's got to be a revelation. It's not just a teaching. Uh, but the point is, Jesus is greater than angels. If, if we don't understand, okay, that's fine. Some of the theological, that's fine. Jesus is great. No angel conquered death. No angel destroyed, uh, shown the devil to be inoperative. No angel. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Verses 17, 18, the, the, the last two verses, Christ is a sympathetic high priest to his people. Angels aren't. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren. Remember, anytime you see, anytime you see therefore in the Bible, just read the previous verses. <laughs> read the previous verses. So we just read why, why he, he became like his brethren because he had to take on flesh and blood, right? He had to take on flesh and blood. He had to take on flesh and blood in order to defeat death. He had to die as a man in order to defeat death in order to defeat the power of the enemy. And even going on back, he, on back, he had to take on flesh in order to be the captain of our salvation, the pioneer of our salvation to bring us into glory. So he says, therefore, in all these things, he had to be made like his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. This high priest, we're going to talk a lot about high priest in the coming weeks. Remember, one of the reasons people get hung up on Hebrews is the warnings, and they don't understand all of the Old Testament Hebrew uh, rituals and the sacrificial system, but we're going to talk about it. Then it says in verse 18, for in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. And when you really think about this, this is a really special phrase, angels can't identify with our weaknesses, can they? Angels cannot identify with our hurts. In the context of who he's speaking to, y'all think so, y'all are the Hebrews, okay? Y'all think are so highly of the angels, but yet all this persecution, all everything that you're going through, the angels, they have no clue what you're going through. They have no clue the, the just the chastisement and, and everything that you're going through. Jesus does. Jesus does. That's what that means. It said he was made like his brethren. He experienced what it means to be a human. He experienced what they're going through, the persecutions that they're going through, except without sin. He knew what it was like to be despised and rejected by his own people. We know that these Hebrews, they're being despised and rejected by their own people. They're being also by the Romans. He knows what it, what it means to face suffering and death. And this is what allowed him to be a merciful and faithful high priest. And when we get into high priest, studying the high priest, you'll really be blessed by that. I'm not getting into that now because we're going to close. So many other high priests failed in their calling. But Jesus did not fail. He's the perfect high priest, the faithful high priest. Uh, propitiation, that's another big word, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Uh, that simply means to atone for the sins of the people. In other words, what he did to take away sin. What he did to take away sin, that's propitiation. He took away our sin. So chapter 2, that's chapter 2. The first warning against drifting. Jesus is greater than the angels. He restored dominion. He brought us to glory. He disarmed Satan and overcame death. He's our merciful and faithful high priest who identifies with us. He knows what we're going through. None of the angels have done that. So it's almost like, okay, there's case number one. Now, do you still want to turn back? 
Do you still want to go back to the old way? <laughs> you still want to go back under the law, the old system? And that's chapter two. Any comments, any application, any special revelation things that you've seen as we've gone through this? No, but I, I had a unique situation recently with a cult. The ones who have knocked on doors a lot um, and want to hand you pamphlets. Um, they're not doing that so much during COVID. I got a telephone call from somebody. And an unusual situation, I don't usually answer num numbers I don't recognize, but there was a name associated with this number. I'm like, maybe I've talked to this person before. And she carried on this conversation with me and then she started asking questions. And it wasn't until we were a good five minutes into it that I said, you're not by any chance a Jehovah Witness, are you? And she says, yes, I am. And she, said, she, she did all her witnessing over the telephone. She, hmm. And I wish I'd had my Bible handy and I wish mm -hmm. I had Hebrew handy. Mm -hmm. But she caught me kind of off guard, which is really the whole way they mm -hmm. operate. Mm -hmm. so she said, can I call you back? And I said, uh, only if you'll let me share the gospel with you. <laughs> there you she go. hasn't called back. So. <laughs> <laughs> this is a unique way of sharing about mm -hmm. who they think Jesus is. Mm -hmm. And the, the really, the, that's the, the unique thing about cults is they use a lot of the same words, mm -hmm. but have a different definition of the word. Mm -hmm. You had one word in your atonement. Mm -hmm. The Christian scientist says that means at one one. Oh, okay. So yeah. You're at one. Uh huh. You're thinking like you. Uh huh. You're the same as Jesus. Yeah, and it's partly right, but it misses something. Yeah, no, it's there. There, it's a completely. It's what's well, actually. It's the antithesis. I mean, we're the only way. We don't become like Jesus. He became like us. Yeah. That's the whole point of Hebrews. He became like us. He atoned for our sins. We don't join up with him and become mutual partners yeah. in atoning for sin yeah. <laughs> through positive attitudes and all that. No, he did it all for us. It's a science, yeah. yeah. They're, you're like us, and therefore you yeah. you have mind over matter. Mind over matter. Just like Jesus had mind over mm -hmm. matter. And he was a great prophet and teacher, and therefore he transcended above what most humans mm -hmm. do. Yep. So, so, listen, when we get into these scriptures... And you, you, maybe you're leaving here today and you're saying, man, I didn't understand a lot of that. That's okay. You're stretching yourself. You're growing to maturity. That's the point of Hebrews is to grow towards maturity. We're moving past the ABCs. <laughs> We're moving past sucking on a bottle. You know, We're getting into the deep things. Sometimes it takes, I don't, I don't understand everything completely and none of us, never will. The point is, if you, if you see Jesus in a bigger light than when you came in, then the word is doing its job. And in, in essence, it's almost like the writer is trying to blow their minds anyways and make Jesus so big that it's like, you know what, I don't understand everything you're saying, but, but you know what, I'm not going back to the old way. So, you know, just challenge yourself. That's why these studies like this are good, even if even if maybe some of it seems boring or whatever, and you don't complete, it's, it's okay. That's okay. We're moving on to maturity. And we're going to study in Hebrews, he talks about moving on to maturity, moving past the milk to the meat of God's word, going into the deep things. So, so don't you want to go deeper? Don't you want to get deeper in, into, the, in, into the word and learn things that, that you haven't learned before? That should, be, that should be our aim, our goal, right? We always want to learn something new. And so as you go home and read through chapters one again and chapters two again, especially if you're discouraged right now, if you're in a situation where you feel like giving up, read through chapter one. It's their short chapters. Read through chapter two. Read through it. Read through it again. And I'm going to post the video online. But as we come through this Hebrews, this is a phenomenal, phenomenal book. You're, you come through Hebrews, you're going to come through 
more mature, a more mature Christian. And that's the whole point. We're not going back to the old. We're not giving up. We're not giving up. We're not giving up. <laughs> Amen. Let me close. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to stop this, and then we're going to have some prayer time for the next couple of minutes for people that need prayer. Lord, we just thank you for your word, and we just thank you, Father, for, for this letter, and we just pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, that as we, we want to become students of the, we don't want to just be just Christians going through the motions. We want to be mature students of the word of God. We want to, we want to study your word. We want to, we want this word to get in our heart that we might not sin against you. We want to see Jesus as greater than anything. We, we look at everything that Jesus Christ has done for us and, 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 and it just, it builds our faith. And even we want to take heed to the warnings. We don't want to neglect what we already have. We, we don't want to neglect the disciplines, Bible study, prayer, worship, fellowshipping together, because we don't want to drift away. We don't want to, we don't want to lose rewards in the kingdom. We want, to, we want to stay faithful to you, Father, and we want to keep going forward. And we just pray that over every single person in here and, and even those that will be studying this with us and, and looking at these uh, lessons online. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.